Blessings, everyone. This is Dale from the Precept Classes in Coleman, Alabama, and I thank you for joining me again for First Samuel. This is Lesson 3, and we're covering chapters 8 through 12 today. Uh, the big picture of this, this is where Saul becomes king, where Saul becomes king. Uh, make sure you go listen to the first two lessons if you haven't already, okay? So let's jump into chapter 8. Uh, Samuel has appointed his sons as judges over Israel when he was old. Now, this was something he probably shouldn't have done. As a matter of fact, I can tell you he shouldn't have done it because his sons, Joel and Abijah, were dishonest. They took bribes and they perverted justice, okay? All other judges that we saw and that we see in Scripture, the Lord has raised them up. But here Samuel had appointed them. Well, finally, the people of Israel came. The elders came and approached Samuel at Ramah, his home, and they pointed out, they said, hey, man, your sons are corrupt. We don't want to live under them. We don't want them to be judges. We want you to appoint a king for us. And there's a twofold thing that's going on right here. Uh, the nation of Israel had been tempted before to have a king and have a king. They wanted a king. Uh, they were really, and we see this in just a moment, rejecting God as king. But then they tell them, tell us, Samuel, first of all, your sons are corrupt. Okay, We don't want them judging us or ruling over us in this way. Also, we want to be like everybody else. All the other nations around us have kings, and we want to be like that. Well, this really broke Samuel's heart, and it broke the Lord's heart, because Israel was to be something different. They were to be holy. They were to be separate, and the Lord was to be their king. So Samuel responded like he normally did. He went before God, and he prayed, and the Lord comes back to him. He says, okay, don't worry about it, Samuel. They haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. I think Samuel's heart was also broken some because his sons were not acting the way that they should have been. Uh, but the Lord said, they're rejecting you. He said, I'm going to give them a king, but I want you to warn them about the procedure of the king. And you did a good bit of homework and your cross-references and everything about what a king was and what the prince was. Now, when you get into this chapter right here, he tells them, here's what's going to happen. Here's the procedure of the king. You're being warned. He's going to take your sons, and he's going to take your daughters, and he's going to get them to do all uh, his work and various jobs for him. He's going to take the best of your fields, the best of your vineyard, the best of your produce, of your farmland. He's going to take a tenth of your seed and your flock. And in class, we're all going, oh, that it was only that way today. <laughs> you know, From verse 18 on, it really was a prophetic thing. Because he told him, he said, you're going to cry out to me because of what your king has done. And in that day, I'm not going to listen to you because of what has happened. But Israel refused to listen to the word of warning. They said, we want a king like the other nations. And then they said this, we want a king to judge and to go out and fight our battles for us. See, they didn't want to trust in the Lord. I've got news for you, folks. We do the same thing. Oh, the church is so bad about this. The church, rather than turning to the Lord, says, we want a king. We want a king. Oh, we got different names for them. We usually call them pastors. And we want to go out. We try to find a hired gun that will come and do great and wonderful things and do our battle for us and make our church great and make our church wonderful. And it's exactly what we're seeing right here. We don't depend upon the Lord. You hardly ever see the Lord going out and getting a hired gun. He always raises up leadership from within. I'm sort of excited because I'm seeing this happen to a small degree in churches today. But for the most part, we still act the same way they do. We reject the Almighty God. So in chapter 9, we see the one that is going to become the first king, Saul. God gives them the kind of king they want, Saul. He gives them later the kind of king he wanted, David. That doesn't mean that Saul could not have been a godly king. I do believe that Saul could have been a godly king. And we'll talk very quickly as we go through these lessons about Saul. Saul started out, we see him right here, he's a mighty man of valor, one of, uh, 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 from a father of a mighty man of valor, okay? He was choice, he was handsome, he was rich, he was a head taller than everybody else. If you ever notice our politicians, you will notice that quite often they're, that, that's their description, okay? Well, one day, Saul's dad, Kish, his donkeys were gone, so he sent Saul out to find them. He didn't know that the Lord was going to use this little donkey expedition to do something to direct him to Samuel. Now, the Lord spoke to Samuel and told Samuel, said, hey, tomorrow you're going to meet somebody, and this is going to be the one that I want you to anoint as prince over Israel. So make sure you read this entire chapter to see the story. It's quite a story that's going on right here. Chapter 10, uh, at the end of their time together, and the thing that happened in chapter 9, uh, uh, Samuel anoints Saul. And it's sort of a private anointing, shall we put it that way? He anoints him and he prophesies over him. He says, here's some things that are going to happen right here. When you leave, you're going to have these encounters. 
The second that Saul turns around to leave from Samuel, says this in verse 9 and forward, God changed his heart. Hang on to that phrase. God changed his heart. And the signs that he spoke of came about. He had an encounter with a group of prophets, and Saul starts to prophesy. There's a reason for that. And you did a study, uh, a lot of cross-references on the Spirit of the Lord. And basically, in the Old Testament, you see the Spirit of the Lord coming upon somebody and resting upon them and also leaving. Now, we're going to see something a little different with David in the next lesson or two. But here, the Spirit of the Lord would come upon him. And so there was a, something that comes along. The, the, uh, uh, Samuel called Israel together, presented uh, Saul to them and said, here is your king. And everybody's going, yeah, yeah, this is great because he's good looking. He's tall. He's handsome. We're excited. We've got a king now. Well, hurriedly now. Chapter 11, the Ammonites came and besieged Gabish. And they called out to their, and said, hey, will you give us seven days to see if anybody will come and help us? Saul hears about this. He rallies Israel together, and they come, and they defeat uh, the Ammonites. Well, at that time, everybody's going, yeah, man, Saul's the guy. He's our leader. To such a degree, they're going, who are the people? Because there were people saying, who's this Saul? Nobody's heard of him. What kind of king is he going to make? Well, at this time right now, they're going, let's bring those people out here and kill them because they doubted Saul. And Saul says, no, 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 not today. Nobody in Israel is going to die today. Well, then we get to chapter 12. And you see uh, that Samuel, uh, he's coming along and spoke to Israel. And Samuel refers to Saul as the Lord's anointed. Over and over, Samuel is saying this. He is the one that the Lord has anointed. You need to follow him. You need to fear him. But you find out, he keeps telling him something's going to happen if you're not careful. If you fear the Lord and serve him and listen to him and don't rebel, everything's going to be okay. If you don't listen to him, then you're going to have a tough time and God's going to be against you. The Lord sent a miracle at that time to cause fear upon them. And the fear of the Lord came upon them because it's, it's the wheat harvest, not supposed to rain. And all of a sudden it started raining, started thundering. As usual, they came and they confessed their sins and Samuel prayed for them. And verse 22 tells us the end of this thing. It tells us why the Lord didn't abandon his people. It says it was because of his great name and it pleased him to make them his people. Think about that. It wasn't because of their goodness. It wasn't because of their might. It wasn't because of their power. It wasn't because of their faithfulness or even their obedience. It was because of the great name of God, and it pleased him to do that. It really speaks a lot to us because it isn't because of any great thing that we've ever done that we're saved. It isn't because of the great things that we do in his name that he moves and does wondrous things. It's simply to his praise and his glory and for his name. Yes, we're to trust in the Lord. We're going to see more about that. We're to be faithful. We're to be obedient. But as we saw last week, we are not to worship our, the idols, the buildings, the programs, the structures, the great music, the great things we do in the name of the Lord. Sorry about that. Um, we're not to do that. As we see right here, we're not to worship the king. We're not to look upon the outside. We'll see more about that later. And say, oh my, this is the one. We're going to be all right. We got a king to fight our battles now. We are to worship the Lord Most High and realize that He is our stronghold. He is our shield. He is our protector. He is the one that fights for us. Allow the Lord to speak to you in these passages to show you His truth that He has just for you and what you need to hear. He's faithful to do that. Again, I'm Dale from the Precept Classes in Coleman, Alabama. And I'll see you again next time with Lesson 4. Goodbye.